I just wanted to say, um, you're a part of a, of a vision that even people like me from afar are watching and excited about. Some guy from Oklahoma who you know, Dudley, <laughs> he calls me up <laughs> and starts talking about this. So it's really a pretty cool thing. You may not know this, but you're a part of a, of a of kind of a God movement. And obviously, when you're in the first time, there's probably you know things that you're going, well, you know, this didn't work right or this or, or whatever. But the truth is, is that um, you're really part of a neat God movement, and I am honored to get to hang out with you. Now, I am... Um, I'm a person who loves the Bible, but I am not a, uh, a Bible teacher like what you've had, like Wayne. It sounded like he, was, he did great stuff on Exodus. I'm going to take biblical principles and talk about that in the area of relationships and leadership and, and in also your personal life. In fact, the first one I'm going to actually do is more a little bit personal life, just to kind of give you a foundation. And um, I'm, what I'm really inter- I realize that people, you know, can only uh, learn as much as, uh, you know, after a while, when you're sitting down, you just can't handle that too much. So, um, you know, we'll take breaks. We'll also do a lot, probably more Q&A and just kind of dialogue than you might be used to. So don't be shy about, you know, breaking it up, asking a question. At the end, we'll always kind of talk about something. We'll probably do a couple of experiential things. I'm not going to have you, you know, share your grossest sin or something like that. But um, it will be good to kind of, you know, work We've through some of this stuff. That. Okay, great, great. So do you know everybody's grossest sin? No, I'm but. kidding. <laughs> I am so bummed that I missed that one. Bummer, no. Um, but the way I want to start is I'm going to talk about a subject that has become near and dear to me and that's not been as near to de- and dear in my life, probably. I mean, I'm kind of a fun guy, but... Um, so I had cancer. Uh, old people start talking about what they had. You know, one time we talked about hernias. I mean, you know, how gross is that? You guys, none of you guys have these kind of experiences. But... I got can- I, what happened was I get a call from my doctor and he goes, Jim, you need to come in this afternoon and bring your wife, which is never a good thing when they say bring your wife. So Kathy and I go in there and he goes, well, bad news, you have cancer. Um, good news, we can probably take care of this. And so I end up at a place in Los Angeles. I live in, in California. In Los Angeles, um, and it's called the City of Hope, and it's one of the great cancer centers in the world, really. And I'm kind of freaked out by being there, and I'm all of a sudden realizing that I'm going to have this surgery. And the day before, you have to sign. Anybody here had surgery where you have to sign things, like your life away? Anybody? Yeah. Well, you do. And it's like you're going to die if you take too much aspirin. This could kill you. And so it must have been in my mind, because Kathy and I were staying at a hotel um, nearby, and I had a 5 o'clock, you know, come into the City of Hope thing. And um, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I go, what if this is the last day that I had on earth. Now, I didn't think I was going to die, okay? Now, my mother-in-law did because she said to Kathy, uh, she goes, you know what, you and Jim have had a great marriage and you guys have a great family and, you know, it's, it's, you're young enough where you could get married to somebody else and, you know, you could have two happy marriages. I'm like, give me a break. She's dead now, so I, I, uh, you know, I won, I guess. But, um, but I never thought I was going to die. I mean, I really didn't. Um, I even asked the, the surgeon could we postpone this because I do quite a bit of speaking and I went, could I, I was in the middle of a speaking season and I go, could I postpone this cancer surgery until I'm done with my speaking season? And, and he kind of went, you're an idiot. And, um, said, no, we're going to do it next week. So, you know, there I am. I now am up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking, what would I want to say to my kids? Okay. And my kids were about the age of you, maybe a little bit older, but not much. I have three daughters, so we have no hormones or drama in our life, of course. And uh, in fact, Rick married my daughter, Christy, to her husband, Steve, um, just on the other side of the Hyatt. Uh, Eric and I went over there yesterday. It was fun. Saw tortoises. Um, But anyway, um, so what would I want to say to my kids? And I never thought, I I ended up writing a book on it, but I never thought I would write a book on it. I never really thought it was going to be a big deal, but it, it became... Uh, something very important in my life, and that's why I want to kind of lay it as a foundation for you. So I get up, and I write down a couple of things. How, what are those important phrases? And what you're going to get from me this week for the few days is you're going to get some of those phrases, and I'll I'll mention when I say a phrase, I'll I'll tell you, because today I'll give you a a couple, three of them. But um, when I, what I first did was I wrote down a scripture and the scripture is a very important scripture to me, and, and I hope it be, is an important scripture to you. By the way, it's out of the Sermon on the Mount. It, the Sermon on the Mount is the most often quoted uh, sermon ever. Jesus uh, wrote the Sermon on the Mount, spoke the Sermon on the Mount, actually. He didn't write it, but he, he spoke the Sermon on the Mount. And even people who aren't Christian say that it's one of the most profound 
um, pieces of biblical literature, even people who would call that that because they're not necessarily even Christian. Mahatma Gandhi said it was the greatest you know, words ever, and he wasn't a Christian, right? So anyway, it's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So a lot of times if you, you know, some of you might end up going into ministry, and if you're going to speak on, um, you know, if you're going to speak, you know, how you close is important. So I'm going to preach here on Sunday, and my close, I love my closing for what I'm going to do um, here at the church. And so the closing is important. This is the closing. So this is Jesus at the end summarizing the Sermon on the Mount, right? So let's take a look at this scripture. It's found, again, in Matthew. Um, somebody's clicking it for me. Right? What's that? Oh, I got to do what? There we go. Okay. So, are you clicking for me, or am I? I don't have a clicker. So. Oh, okay. So sorry. Huh? I'm on my own. You have no idea. My adult ADD kicks in, and I have no idea. What's that? For a for a Mac? No. Noah, show me. Okay, just, I can do it, but just show me. Show me where to click. The only time I've ever done it is I click with a clicker and I didn't bring one. Oh, jeez. You're awesome. Okay. Okay. Now you're all going, I am never going to listen to anything this guy has to say with what he just did. Okay. So this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's always interesting. You've heard this before. But whenever Jesus would say, or whatever, wherever in the scripture it says, therefore, it's talking about what has just proceeded. So we're not studying the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, maybe you will before the end. But the Sermon on the Mount is this profound, profound uh, message, like I said. But he's saying, therefore. So it's, in other words, he goes, now that we've said all this, here's what we're going to look at. And it, goes the, and it goes this way. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, with the, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, now, obviously, Jesus was talking about something that every person understood because, again, they understood that when the rain came, their, their, um, their houses and where they lived and what they experienced, you know, when they had wind and rain and whatnot, it, it killed the houses, basically. And so they had to be really careful how you build your, your house. What's interesting is here in Kauai, that would be the same thing. I remember having a, I was speaking at a church in Honolulu, and it was after Hurricane, what was it called? Niki. And they have a phone tie-up. I don't know if you remember this, but they have a to phone tie-up with you. You're on somebody's roof, maybe uh, the roof of the church or something, and you're talking to Dan Chun's church because you were raising some money or something for it. And I was so aware that even here they think about these foundations because, again, when the weather comes in, you know, it's not a pleasant place. So all these people understood this. And so Jesus, you know, used it really well in terms of this illustration. He goes, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man. By the way, it could say the, the Greek for man is actually more person, but they use it in the male form, but it's for all of us. Um, foolish person who built their house on the sand. And the rain came down and the streams arose, shouldn't say rot, and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. So basically, what you have to understand in your own life, whether that be with relationships, leadership, or personal life or whatever, is that rain and wind is going to come. If it hasn't come, then it will come. I mean, maybe some of you came from a family that was less than perfect. I came from a family where my dad was an alcoholic. Um, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I wasn't raised in the church. Um, I meet Kathy the very first day in college. Her family was just crazy. We started dating that about three months later, and we thought actually, for even in relationship during that time, because we were Christians, because we we're going to ministry, it was going to be easy. And our relationship was not easy. We we've been married 48 years. We still call it a high maintenance marriage, right? Meaning you have to work on it. Okay, and um, we have a good marriage. We actually speak on marriage together at things, but. The fact is, is that we had to learn that if we built our foundation for our life personally, in our marriage, and even with our kids in life, it wasn't going to go. And a lot of people, even Christians like yourselves, um, we don't think enough about being proactive about building our life on the foundation, on the rock. Because again, like I said, you know, rain, wind, and storms come everywhere. So it's not a matter of if the storm's going to come. And I, I don't know you yet. But I would guess that some of you are 
potentially, possibly in a storm, and maybe you even came here because you were kind of in a storm and you thought maybe you could get out of the storm. Some of you were raised in a storm because of the, your home background, and some of you will have a storm. I mean, I never thought I was going to have cancer. My wife is one year free of being at the City of Hope with, with cancer. Never dream those kind. We don't think about that kind of stuff, okay? So anyway, that's the deal. Now, I want to give you a, a, a quote by C.S. Lewis. I'm kind of a C.S. Lewis freak. And this is really good for your, for somebody, I mean, it's good for somebody my age. It's great for somebody your age. I wish somebody would have told me this. I should have read C.S. Lewis back then. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. You got to think about that. That's a, a great thought. You know what? For a lot of the stuff that you've done, you can't go back. Sure, you can repair the past. You might have to delve into why do I act the way I act and stuff like that. But in reality, as Christians, we get a new life and a new beginning every day, right? And so what C.S. Lewis is saying here is that it's critical for us to, go, to not just dwell on the past and, oh, wow, I came, my dad was an alcoholic, and so I'm going to become a jerk, and I'm never going to make this or whatever. I can, I can move. One of the things I'm going to say at church on Sunday, which, you know, I don't know if all of you, you know, end up coming, but on church on Sunday is that you have a choice to either recover or repeat the sins of a previous generation. The Bible says that you inherit the sins of the previous generation to the third and fourth generation. So for me, when I start really understanding this, I go, you know what, I'm not an alcoholic like my dad. Um, I'm not a codependent type person like my mom was because she was, her dad was an alcoholic, so you know, it just kind of ran in the family. Um, and, but I have some of these traits from my family, even though I was a Christ follower and knew in Christ. So what I realized was I had to put a stake in the ground and say, I'm gonna recover instead of repeat. Okay, and so again, this thought helps us understand that you know wherever we are, we can change. So in the next session, I'm going to talk about communication because I think it's so critical. And one of the things I'm going to say in there, and I'll say it over and over again in that one, is that communication. Communication is a learned trait. So you're going to learn how to. You can learn how to communicate better. But this is the stage and the time to do it because if you don't you're gonna bring more baggage into your kind of relationships and to your life and whatnot. So, so how do you build a, a strong foundation? This is gonna be so random for some of you because a lot of time, you've been now in Bible school and we've been looking and you've been doing right what you do in Bible school. You've been looking through scriptures and I'm gonna take some scriptural principles now and put it into it. And you know what, the first, after I wrote that scripture down for me, like what would I wanna share with my kids? You know what the first one I wrote? Have serious fun. You know, it sounds kind of weird because, you know, you're here, you an amazing amount of laughter, but we need to have serious fun. So I, I am, I, I hardly ever tell people this because I don't want to be the brainiac type person, but, um, and I'm really not, to be honest, but when I did my PhD, it was in uh, youth ministry, and it was also, and it was in England, and it was also on, tr and I wrote my dissertation on traits of a healthy family, and you know what the number one trait was? Play having serious fun. Families that, I know we should say families that pray together, stay together, and I think they do, but I also believe that families that play, that play together do. And so the idea of having serious fun, so um, my background is youth ministry just like Rick's, and so I was a youth pastor for you know, 17 years, and um, my daughter Heidi, who's gonna be here on Sunday, uh, my daughter Heidi, one day Kathy and I are sitting at the kitchen table and we're doing bills. And I can honestly tell you that I've never once enjoyed doing bills. If I have money or don't have money, I hate doing bills. I just hate that. Kathy does most of that anyway. And um, so we're sitting there and we're doing bills and it's not a great day. And so Heidi is my child who kind of like bounces in. I mean, she's just like full of life and full of joy and she's charming and you know, this is just her. She's just always been like this. So she comes bouncing in and she goes, I love Scott and I love Anita because she had just babysat the kids. <laughs> And uh, she goes, but I had no idea, Dad, that you were their youth pastor, that you actually married them. And um, you know what they said? That when you and Mom were you know, in youth ministry and Mom discipled Anita, that you guys were fun and you guys were funny. And then she just stopped. It wasn't like she goes, what happened? But that's, and I kind of look at Kathy. So first of all, they go, she goes, they're the best parents and you guys were fun and funny. And I went, we're not as fun and funny. And I, I'm not telling, you know, talking about telling the, you know, cute little joke. I'm saying, I don't know that, we, I think we had lost some of that fun factor. And I even looked at Kathy in that moment, and we had been married, you know, for numerous years by this time. 
And I went, we don't even have as much fun. You know, I'm looking at her and I go, maybe I'm kind of like, maybe our marriage is even stale because we don't really play together. And I thought, our family. Guy, we're all into homework and school and studies and stress and, you know, three girls, boyfriends and, you know, money and, you know, trying to pay for it all and whatnot. And I went, I don't know that we're that fun. So the next day I was at CVS, it's Long's here, um, same place, on drugs, and I'm for some reason picking up a prescription or something for Kathy or whatever. And then there were these refrigerator mags that, magnets and it said, have fun. And then it goes, are you having fun yet? And I, I've never bought a refrigerator mag in my life. In fact, we have all kinds of them on our refrigerator. None of them were ones that I bought, except that one. The, are you having fun? Because I realized, you know what? I need to proactively play more. And actually, it's, it's very spiritual to do that, to, to play. You know what happens when you play? Um, your spirit kind of opens up. So after my cancer surgery, what I realized was that, no, if I was going to really build a foundation of health in my life and in my relationships, I was going to have to have some fun. So let me ask you a question. How's the fun factor in your life? I mean, it might be good. I mean, especially you're here, you're, you know, everybody, I was sitting here talking to a friend of mine who's on the North Shore, and um, then everybody kind of, there were a bunch of people who unloaded, you know, out of the cars, and you'd all been to the beach. I mean, that's fun. But people who do well play well. I mean, you can be incredibly successful, but people who do well play well. People who have good relationships play well. If you are negative Nancy, or you're negative Ned, and you're negative, and you're whining and complaining and grumbling. We'll talk more about this in another, another session. But if you're doing that, you know what? People kind of don't, aren't drawn to you. And to be honest, part of that is a habit. I know that there are people who are funnier and people who are more optimistic, and that's just kind of a natural. But if you're a person who's like always down um, for whatever reason, you're not going to have good relationships. It's a proven fact that people who um, have fun, tend to ha do better in relationships. People who, you know, don't have any fun tend to not do as well uh, in relationships. So there's a, another scripture. That's funny that I'm, I totally forgot I was doing it. Um, and this scripture is found in Proverbs 17, 22, and it says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And you're probably familiar with this. A lot of the scriptures that I'm going to probably use are, are familiar. Um, but Another way of it saying it, this is a more modern version, is a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit zaps a person's strength. You ever done that when you're down? I mean, every one of us have been down. I mean, if you haven't been that, you're weird. Um, so if you've been down, what does it do? It zaps your strength, right? And so have we ever thought about putting energy into being more cheerful? And I'm not talking about faking it, okay? But I'm saying, do you do, do, you do things on a regular basis, on a daily basis that bring you joy? You know, this morning, um, I got up kind of early, I got out in the car, and then I just kind of walked on the beach, because I live at the beach, I live in Dana Point, so it's not that different in terms of, I mean, there's probably more palm trees. But, you know, I love going down there at sunrise, I take my dog, I've got a golden retriever, and that's fun for me. Um, Kathy and I paddleboard together, that's fun as a couple together. Um, as a family, we're gonna be together for a week, and we're gonna play together, and our family will draw closer because of that. So I'm saying, even at your age, is there a part of your life where you go, hey, I'm going to have, I'm going to literally lean into fun on a regular basis, okay? Because again, if not, when the rains come and the storms come and all that, you know, you're going to be crushed as we all have at times. So, um, you know, there you go, okay? So like I said, you know, the family that, you know, prays together, stays together, I get it, but also plays together. So here's a couple of things about, about this. I don't know if it's in my, I haven't, I'm not even aware of what I do here usually. So play is often the missing ingredient to a good relationship. Think about that. So the people that you might be closest to are, um, that just sucks that you had to bring all the Kleenex. You must be sick. <laughs> I'm <am> so sorry. <laughs> That's just like so random. All of a sudden he walks in, I'm like, oh, he must be sick. Um, but play is the missing ingredient to a lot of relationships. You know, a lot of times we look at all these hard, you know, these hard issues and whatever, no. I'll say to couples, like there was a couple, I was doing a marriage conference in um, Florida, and this couple is gonna be there for like, you know, three days or whatever, and they're in a mess. 
And um, they go, we haven't spent any time together. We don't date. We don't do this. And I go, you know what? Don't come to the conference. Go to Di the, the lady said she wanted to see Disney World. And they didn't have time to go. So I said, go to Disney World. They go, we don't have money. I, uh, and this, my, this is in front of my wife because she was doing the conference too. I pull out my wallet and I give her, I had like $120. I give the woman $100 and just said, go to Disneyland. This isn't even one ticket. You lost your shit. A, a bug? That's, well, I hope that's, that's like frightening. <laughs> like I'm, but, but so I gave her this money and, and they didn't go to the conference and they went to Disney World and they write to me like, once every six months now, just going, thank you so much. We had the greatest time. Our marriage is back together. And what I did was, I get, digitally, they could still hear my talks if they wanted to hear the talks, right? But what I was saying is, these people needed fun, you know? And, and there had been a lot of rain and wind and stuff. So again, play is often the missing ingredient to a good relationship. Play opens up closed spirits. So play is the glue that can bring a family back together. So I've said to, to parents, you know, they're having trouble with their 17 year old, okay? And I'll just go, do you ever do anything like play with them? And again, when you think of play with a 17 year old, you know, it's not like you go, oh, we're gonna go out and swing on a swing. I mean, maybe that's fun, I don't know. But, but you know, what do they like to do? So I started, in high school, I started dating my daughters. And I'd go, you can do whatever you want under, you know, financially, you know, we're, we'll talk about it. They always wanted to go out to eat. So we'd go out to eat, we'd talk. Sometimes we would talk about snowboarding or all my girls surf, surfing, you know, whatever. But what was fascinating was, is that drew us together and play was actually just eating, okay? But as a family, you find things to do. But also even now with you all, you know, it's gonna open up a closed spirit. If you're in a broken relationship, say with your mom or your dad, um, amazing that if you did something that would be fun together. I know a dad who was with a son, I spent a lot of time more with, with parents with teens. But, um, and so you guys are just right above that. But uh, I, he, this guy, they love ba the guy loved baseball, lives in California. And I said, why don't you go on a trip with your son? Because he had told me that he always wanted to take his son to all of the Major League Baseball teams in the West Coast. So it'd be like the San Diego Padres on up to the Seattle Mariners. And so they did. They got in a car. They did it in like a week. And he goes, it was unbelievable how good it was. He goes, I mean, it wasn't like every moment we were having a great time and we had some tension, but we played together. I mean, and we went to these games and we have all this bonding thing. So play opens up closed spirits. Play builds memories. I mean, nobody, like this thing, what you guys are experiencing is a memory that you'll remember for the rest of your life. And part of it won't be, you go, hey, there was this bald-headed nerdy guy that spoke on relationships. You're not even gonna remember who I am. But what you might remember is that a couple of you went and you, or you learned how to surf or you, you, know, you had these experience, experiences together, right? So play builds memories big time and it builds big memories big time in a family. When you look at your favorite family memories, you, you're not going, oh, it was when the family got in a big argument over you know, whatever. <laughs> or it was crazy Aunt Mary or whatever it is. What was it? It was something that you did together that was fun, right? Play reduces stress. So when you're feeling stress, sometimes, obviously, like I tell people when they're reducing, if they're trying to reduce stress, read the Psalms, read the Proverbs, pray, do all this kind of stuff. But sometimes what you need to do is honestly just go play. So what are things that you guys do to kind of play to reduce stress? Play in the water. What do you do? Play in the water. Play in the water. Totally. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. Surf. Surf. Run. Drive around the island. Drive around the island. Guitar. Guitar. Guitar would, is really, I was thinking about that when you guys were singing last night and playing, or you were singing, right? You have a great voice, by the way. But, um, but you know, that for some people, that is an amazing way to, to also reduce stress, along with other things. What else? Skiing. Skiing. Eating food. Eating food. Yeah. You're my man. Um, but yeah, no, totally. So again, um, at the end of your year, if you were sitting around the dinner table with your family and you said, um, let's go over some of the top things that you know, really were the highlights of the year, I mean, nobody's gonna go it, say, oh, it was that argument that we had that was just so awesome. You know, it was this or that. It was, you know what? It's, I was in Kauai and I surfed or I, you know, I was in the water or I walked or I, ran, I, I went 
you know, I, I started running more, whatever it is, see, food. I, I had this amazing meal, that's me. My family's like, dude, you get, over, get past this, because I go, oh, I remember it was 10 years ago. It was the best, you know, something, and they're like, 10 years ago, I don't re you don't remember, like, the dog's name, and now you're telling me you remember the food, but I do. Okay, so again, that's, a, that's a, a critical thought. So the question I would ask for you is, how's the fun factor in your life? I don't know if that's gonna show up or not. How's the fun factor in your life? Nope, that's the next thing. So how is the fun factor in your life? If you're kind of doing some journaling while you're here, um, ask how the fun factor is. And you know what, for a lot of you, you're like, wait, this is the most fun I've ever had in my life. I mean, you were just not too long ago living at home and you were under your parents and you had you know, strong curfews and you didn't have what you're experiencing here. So this may be the most fun thing. And obviously, you, you, most of you, almost all of you, you know, will go back home and you know, there'll be you know, stuff there that kind of might bug you or whatever. So the other thing I wrote, and remember I wrote like 12 or 13 things, but the other thing that I wrote was this next phrase. And I wanted to teach this to my kids. And this is so key with relationships, it's so key with personal life, but it's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. So what we have to, to understand, and I don't think I understood it when I, when I was your age at all, but there's pain in life. Sorry, you're gonna have pain in life. You're gonna have pain in relationships. I mean, like I said, uh, Kathy and I have been married 48 years. There's pain in our marriage at times, but there's also deep joy, right? And so it's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. So like for me, um, during the pandemic, I kind of got out of shape and I had knee surgery and you know, I had all these different kind of things. And so I kind of bloomed up and I started getting this. And I, I'd never really had this, okay? Um, and um, so then now I've been working out. So I, in fact, I would look down at the gym over there and kind of went, oh, maybe. Um, but so I've been working out, so I kind of have right now today because, because right before I came, I really worked hard at 24 hour fitness. So I kind of have some pain in my like chest and my arms just because I, I overdid the weights. That's the pain of discipline. There's still pain, but that's the pain of discipline. This is the pain of regret, right? So think about that in your own life. What do you do to, um, to live with discipline that's gonna radically help you have a good life and good relationships. So Paul said to Timothy, interestingly enough, he said in, to, in uh, first, uh, first uh, Timothy 4, 7, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So I think a lot of times we just assume that our, oh man, I'm at a you know, Bible college, this is cool, and we sing cool worship songs and all this, and it's just gonna happen, but we need to be people of discipline. The word for discipline is a word that isn't usually used for discipline. In, in Greek, it, it actually is the word discipline, but it's more like athletic discipline, okay? So it's like runner, okay? That's, there's there's a, such a joy in running. So I ran one marathon in my life, I finished the marathon, and I said to my family, I never want to do this again, and I haven't. But there was, it was so, good to do that, but yet at the same time, it took pain to do it, right? But that's that kind of discipline, but so almost like you're preparing for a game, you're preparing for the Olympics, you're preparing for something, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So it's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. So my own life. In 1983, long before any of you were, you know, even a spark in your parents' eyes, um, I was in my bedroom and I was actually doing my devotions. So a um, little of my background was by 1983, in fact, I wrote a book that Rick edited and you know, kind of put together in 1983. It was called Putting God First. And so we've known each other for a long, you know, for a long time and you know, there, there we were. So I was already speaking around the country. My, my background was that I spoke to students. So I'd speak to about a quarter of a million students a year. And um, anyway, I'm in my bedroom and I'm already kind of, you know, speaking on a na national level, but my devotions were s just sucky, okay? I mean, I would get, it wasn't like I wasn't doing it or I wasn't anti-God. I don't have a story that I was on drugs or, you know, in the arms of another woman or that kind of thing, but I was just really not disciplined. And so that day in my bedroom, I was reading um, my Bible, and uh, which wasn't a daily occurrence, but sort of. Or I would be reading my Bible, like it was supposed to be a devotion, but it was actually to prep for the next talk, okay? Because I was you know, speaking a lot. And um, all of a sudden, I just said to God, 
God, I'm going to give you two hours a day. And the reason I said that was because I heard Billy Graham did, okay? And number two, there was a guy, I went to Princeton for grad work, and there was a Korean guy who was a Christian, and he, um, he gave God 10% of his time. So that was like two hours. I'm like, whoa, if he can do that. I was having trouble giving God like 10 minutes, okay? Um, not that I wasn't serving him, too. I mean, I, by this time, I was, I mean, I'm a youth pastor in a church and doing all these other things. And so I, I said, well, God, I probably am not going to give you two hours. So I'll give you one hour. I had a friend named Becky Tirabasi, and she wrote books on how you can give God one hour a day, and it changes your life. And then I went, not going to work, because I probably can't do, I can't sit still for one hour. So then I said, God, I want to give you 20 minutes. It sounded so wimpy. But I almost kind of felt like the Lord spoke to me and went, I'd love 20 minutes with you. I mean, he wasn't burning on me. He wasn't going, you're some kind of a spiritual wimp. You're a mess. You're out of the will of God, any of that. He's kind of like, cool, let's do it, you know? And so I made a commitment in 1983, and the reason I'm using that is because now we're in almost 2023, but I made a commitment to read, through the, to, to, re, to read the Bible and pray every day. By no means are you looking at like a spiritual giant. Absolutely not. But pretty much I don't miss, okay? And there were seasons where I did, where I would read the one-year Bible, and you know, the last few days after Christmas, I would have to go through you know, like 29 pages or something. But um, in 83, I said, I'm going to give you 20 minutes. And I started reading through the one-year Bible, and I started journaling. <clears throat> and I do the same thing. I've done it. My wife thinks this is so boring, but I write acts, adoration. I did it this morning. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So adoration, I wrote some scriptures down today. Um, confession, I confessed sin. I confessed what was my mindset on some things and whatnot. Um, thanksgiving, I, I thanked God. We're going to spend a whole time on, on, on thankfulness here tomorrow. Um, on th so I just thank God for things. I thank God for you, for you guys. I didn't even get to, I mean, I've been watching you, but I, did, I haven't really, you know, engaged much. And I just thank God for this privilege and what you're going through. And I, na I, I thank God for Rick and, you know, on and on. My family. Not, nothing sexy. And then I just had a little tiny place to pray, uh, I left on my little journal thing, where I could put um, my prayers for. Because a lot of us kind of make us into the master and God the servant. God do this, God do that. And so I did that, okay? So what, what I've realized over the years is that there's kind of an anointing in my life and family, not in some kind of weird way, but I think it happens because if, of something that nobody sees. It's behind that closed door right there, sitting up on my bed, doing my little, you know, in my iPad, going through my one-year Bible and then writing this stuff down. And so what I'm saying to you is if you can learn, you can, have a, you can be full of Bible knowledge after this thing is done. But if you don't put some of that into practice with some discipline, it's going to go away. Okay, and I think even my, I mean, I have seminary degrees and stuff. A lot of that I don't remember, okay. But I do know that sometimes what happens is I get the strength just for the day when I do that. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is that if the, here it's easier. I watched you. I, um, I kind of laughed when I came in on, so it's Monday morning, and there's a bunch of you kind of just laying on couches and whatnot. But a lot of you had your Bibles open. I mean, you were kind of reading some stuff and whatnot. Very cool. Okay. So really, how do you become a person who walks in the Spirit? You do that every day for the rest of your life. Okay. There's no secret to it. Sometimes they're looking for some kind of a secret success. No, you just do that every day for the rest of your life. And that's the pain of discipline um, as opposed to the pain of regret. So the pain of regret is you find yourself straying or, or, or drifting. So we're here on Kauai and let's say that I was going to get on a boat and I was going to try to go to my house at Dana Point because that literally there would be, it would be a straight shot. Okay, It's right on the water in California. Somebody here is from Encinitas too. I, I met the person from Carlsbad. Who's from Encinitas? Oh, hey. We could eat. There's lots of great food in Encinitas and Carlsbad and Lucadia. So, okay, so if I'm taking a boat and I'm going to my place, but if I drift by 1%, I end up in like Panama because we just drift a little. Well, that's what happens with us when we don't do that in terms of the whole idea of the you know, pain of discipline or the pain of regret. So I want to introduce you to a word, grit, okay? Grit. Is, has anybody seen the TED Talk by a woman named Angela Duckworth on grit. 
Um, some of you might want to take a look at it. You know, it's one of the it, 35 million people have seen it. It's the one of the most popular TED talks, and it's not a Christian. She's not coming from a Christian point of view. What she did was she studied successful people, and especially successful people in business and in education. And they weren't the smartest. They were the people who had grit. And grit is when you have passion and perseverance. When you match your passion with perseverance over the long haul, that's grit. Okay? So let's say you said that you like to surf. So if you have the passion of surfing, now it's the perseverance of doing it over and over and over again, you get better, right? And so that's the way with surfing. It's the way with a lot of the things we do, but it's also the way we do this in our Christian life. Okay? It's passion with perseverance. Um, and uh, Duckworth, Angela Duckworth. Yeah, it's fun to look her up. She actually, she, she, it's a really compelling um, TED talk. She has a book out on it too. So discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Grit is passion with perseverance. Here's two scriptures for you. One is found in Revelation 3.10 and it says, endure patiently. So you want to have a good life? You're, you're going to have to endure things, like marriage, okay? So <clears throat> all studies say that people who have a troubled marriage, okay, if they have a troubled marriage, if they are, um, if they'll persevere in that marriage and work on their marriage five, for five years, 78% say that their marriage is better off. But what happens? A lot of people, they, have a, they hit a wall in their marriage and they get a divorce. I mean, maybe some of your parents did that, okay? But if they would have persevered for five years, it's possible that they would have figured it out. So again, the scripture is filled with phrases like this. Endure patiently, endure, which means to persevere patiently, which means you gotta be patient, it's not gonna come. Let's say you, you really want a relationship right now with somebody in the opposite sex, and it's, it's just not happening. So you're gonna have to be patient. Maybe God has a different plan for you for right now, okay? And so you, you, know, you learn patience. The next scripture, and I love this one, it's found in James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial and having stood the test, so when you persevere, then you can stand the test, that person will receive the crown of life um, that the Lord promised to those who love him. So in other words, we persevere under trial and we stand the test. That's what successful believers do, what people who make it in life, what people who do well in relationships, you know, what they do, okay? So last point, and then we'll take a break, um, is glorify and enjoy God while serving him forever. So glorify and enjoy God while serving him forever. I wrote that down. So this is taken out of something all the way back to 1646, okay? And again, I am absolutely not some kind of a scholar, but I never even thought about it. When I was at Princeton um, in grad school, I learned what they call the Westminster Confession. And this is another cool thing for you to look up if you ever want to. It's, I mean, again, it was written in 1646, so it has weird, you know, King James type words. But I studied it. And I never even thought about it. And then when I got cancer, it kind of came back. And it asked an incredible question for you. Maybe you, won't, you might not get a better question, not that this is my question, it's the Westminster Confessions question, the, the whole time you're here at Anchor. What is the chief end of humankind? So in other words, what is the goal from an eternal perspective for your life? What is the chief end of humankind, okay? And uh, the answer is, they say, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So I tweaked it a little bit and put glorify, when I was writing it to my kids, glorify and enjoy God while serving him forever. What if you could do that? Notice, you know what I really like is, for, first we're called to glorify God, praise God. We did that when we were singing, but we're, do, we're to do it with our life. But secondly, we're to enjoy God. A lot of people don't enjoy God. And even people like who are my age, I mean, they're Christians, they've been Christians, but they don't enjoy God. They don't enjoy his grace. They don't enjoy, you know, walking with him. And so what we're called to do is enjoy him, and then we're called to serve him. One of the things that you want to ask while you're here is, God, how, how do you want me to serve you? And, and some of it will be just in basic things that we all are called to serve. And, and maybe some of you are going to get a calling. I, I know somebody's already come in and talked for a day or something on mission. Um, somebody else may do some youth ministry stuff, whatever it might be, but maybe there's a calling in your life. Too many people forfeit God's will by not following their calling. So we're, we have to figure out how to, how to do that. Okay. 
And um, I think that's the story. So, so the truth is, we're all gonna die. I'm, I'm gonna bring this back to me talking about thinking I was gonna die when I had cancer. We're all gonna die. And sooner, like me, because I'm old, um, than you, okay? But nevertheless, we're all gonna die, and how do we wanna live our life? So on your tombstone, which is kind of a gross thing, what do you, how do you want, what do you want it to say? What do you want to be remembered by? Do you want to be remembered by just, um, you know, that you were some kind of cool person? Or do you want to be remembered by something that you did to change the world? I mean, I hope you're a person who goes, no, I want to be remembered for something I did that, you know, changed the world. Um, I love, there's a woman named Anne Lamott. And it's funny because she's kind of a really great writer. She's also um, funnier than I'll get out. And she's, she's a Christian, but she's, you know, she's also kind of funny. She, you know, throughout it, like she has, she has all kinds of language and whatever, but anyway, she's pretty awesome. Um, but, she, but I love this. She said, my deepest belief is to live as if I'm dying because that can set me free. I may have that. Let's see if I do. Yeah, there it is. My deepest belief is that to live as if you are dying can set you free. Dying people teach us to pay attention and to forgive and not sweat the small things. That's an awesome quote, okay? So again, do we, do we live our lives as if we're gonna, you know, we all are gonna die. So I'll close with this illustration then I wanna talk amongst ourselves here for a minute. Um, so uh, my dad um, died. Okay, and again, my dad, I mentioned that he was an alcoholic, and I wasn't super close to him because alcoholics don't do intimacy. Is there anybody else here who has alcoholism in their family system? Yeah, okay, guy, a bunch of us. So, you know, what you realize with an alcoholic is that my dad was a good guy. He just didn't know how to do relationships, so it's not like I was super close to him. But it, at the end of his life, he quit drinking, and he became a Christian, and I wish I could say that he was really a strong Christian, but he, you know, he was a Christian. And, um, and still a character. And um, he, what happened was, I get this call, and they said, um, hey, Jim, you've got to come to the hospital. Your dad has broken his hip. He was 89 years old, and he walked with a walker, so he's really frail. So he, um, he, he was walking in the walker. He fell, busted his hip. And so I'm now sitting in a room with the doctor, my dad, and me. And my dad is in a hospital bed. And the doctor says to my dad, his name is Bob, he goes, Bob, you can, um, I can do a surgery and I can fix your hip, but if you don't get up, you'll, you'll end up dying of something else like pneumonia. And so then he looks at me and I said, Dad, what do you want to do? And he said, I want, I want the hip fixed. I don't want to be in this bed for the rest of my life. And he was, I mean, he was really frail, really weak. So I went, okay. So the guy does the surgery like two days later or whatever, and then we take him to a convalescent hospital and he never got up. So it meant they moved him into hospice. Any of you ever had anybody in hospice? You know, yeah, so you, I mean, it's hard. I mean, you're in a hospice situation. Like, and hospice is weird, because it's emotional. You know they're gonna die. There's some funny parts. There's some sad parts. I mean, it's just weird. And so I'm sitting in hospice with my dad, knowing that he was gonna die in this place. And all of a sudden, this little Filipino lady kind of bounces in, and she's like, hey, it's time for physical therapy. And I'm going, you're not reading your chart because the chart has to say he's in hospice, he's on a bedpan, he can't get up, you know, he's going. And they told us he had about two weeks to live, and, uh, which was exactly right, I guess. So the lady um, says, come on, Bob, get up. And so my dad starts to get up. He couldn't get up. He, it was, he was just like obeying the lady. So he starts to get up and then he crashes. And so I go to catch him. And so now the lady's looking at the chart going, oh, oh, oh. And you know, she probably sees the word hospice. He's going to die. So he said, she's now awkward. She doesn't know what to say. So she looks at my dad and she looks at, at me and she goes, oh, you guys look alike. You must be like the son. And um, my dad says, yes, this is my son. And she, he called me Jimmy. He was the only person who called me Jimmy um, instead of Jim. And um, he goes, this is my son, Jimmy. And I am so proud of him. And so at this point, I was in my 50s. I started crying. My, that my dad said to me, um, I'm proud of you. And he said it to this lady who I didn't even know, right? And he goes, and I have three other brothers, or three other sons, Ron, Bill, and Bob, and I'm proud of them too. And now I'm like, wait a minute, like I'm the youngest. So anybody in here youngest kids? 
Okay, because we're going to talk tomorrow about some family system stuff that'll be really fun then for them. So youngest kids always think they're the best. Like me, as a youngest kid, I'm like going, wait, I understand dad's proud of me, but how could he be proud of the other boys? I mean, all of them, you know, had been in a mess in their life and they'd made poor choices. And I'm like going, how could you be proud of them? I'm just thinking this, not saying it. And then I thought, wait, how like God? God is proud of, of all of us. So he has a picture of you in his wallet. And, you know, that's kind of cool. So anyway, the lady goes on and asks him another question or something. And then my dad says, well, I'm going to die soon. And I'm looking forward to being with God in heaven. And I'm like, that's just weird. So again, my eyes well up with tears because I, I know my dad's going to die, but I didn't want to hear it from his words. He said, I'm actually looking forward to being with Jesus. So this lady, I don't know what her spiritual background was, but she has no context. She has no idea what to say. She has stopped with this. So I'm just kind of waiting and looking at the lady. She goes, okay, well, I'm going to go. And so as she, as she leaves, she pats me on the shoulder and she goes, you have a good dad. And she spoke in a real accent. You have a good dad. And he walks out. So I'm going to give my dad a chance to throw my brothers. I want him to throw my brothers under the bus. So I said, so dad, you said you were proud of all of us. And then he looked at me as clear as could be. And he wasn't clear. He'd been a mess. And he goes, I'm so proud of you, Jim. And I'm proud of the other boys. I really am. And again, I thought, how like God. Then he's, he's waiting for me, and I go, Dad, when you said you were looking forward to being with God, I understand that, but you said you had no regrets. And here's a dad who, um, as an alcoholic, had made some really poor choices in his life, right? And I said, you had no regrets. I mean, Dad, I have regrets. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, Jim, it's more what your, he called it business, not that ministry is a business, but he said, it's more your business than mine, but didn't the Bible say that if you believe in Jesus that you'll be with God and your sins are forgiven? And I went, yes. He said, then why would I have regrets? I'm looking forward to being with God. I went, wow. <laughs> he was living the eternal perspective. So to close it off, there's a woman named Elizabeth Kubler ross and she studies people who die, death and dying. So what she did was, whether they're Christian or not, she, and she's dead now, <laughs> everybody dies. But she studied... Um, what were their last things? You know what their last things? By and large, everybody who's going to die wants a right relationship with God and a right relationship with their loved ones. Isn't that interesting? So my dad, here at the end of his life, he's not talking about money. He's not talking about pressure. He's not talking about his house payment. He's not talking about any of those kinds of things. He's talking about a right relationship with God, and he's right talking about his loved ones. So with us... We need to figure out how are we going to live our lives like that from more of an eternal perspective. I think we do it by having serious fun, understanding that it's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret, and uh, then loving and serving God forever. Okay? So that's kind of my quick devotional thing. Tell me what, what was a thought that came up as I kind of threw this at you. What, what's a thought that kind of came, came up for you? From this, or even a question, if you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's a huge deal. There's people who don't ever get that either. My wife, Kathy, who you guys will see, she's not coming till Thursday, but. Um, she, her dad was not a horrible guy, but he never said, I love you. So when he was dying, he had Alzheimer's. Kathy, they lived in, Fre somebody's from Fresno. Who did we talk to? Yeah, so Fresno. So he was in a home in Fresno. He's, he had Alzheimer's. And we would drive from SoCal to Fresno all the time because Kathy just kept almost waiting for that blessing that she never got. Um, that didn't mean that he was a bad guy. It just meant that she, she felt that part of her life was not fulfilled because she didn't get the love that she'd hoped for from her, from her dad. So when you say that, it's so key that as you dads and moms one day, um, that you say that to your, to your dads and moms. I mean, as, I mean, as a dad and a mom, you say it to your own kids. My mom did that at the end of her life. Her, the last words my mom ever said was, Jimmy, I love you and I'm proud of you. And that's a blessing. I mean, I'll, I'll live that with that blessing for the rest of my life. How amazing. I don't even know that she knew she was dying right then, but how cool was that? And then she died. So we want that. 
We've, and if you didn't receive that, like last week, I write, um, Homeward has about a million people a day. That's the organization I, I'm the president of. They have about a million people a day who come to our website. And in my blog on Monday, it was on giving your kids a blessing. So we, Homeward does strong marriages, confident parents, empowered kids, and healthy leaders. So that's kind of what I do. And so my writing is on those kind of subjects. And my wife called me here and said, hey, I read your blog. I liked it because it was on how you bless your kids. And, he, and she said, and you gave the, you know, the story about your mom. But she goes, I never had that. So there's a lot of people who have never had that from their, their moms or dads, okay? Sometimes you get it from your mom, you don't get it from your dad or whatever. But like, so it's really powerful when, when what you just said, because, you know, if you didn't receive it, then <clears throat> um, you do have a blessing from God, who's our Heavenly Father. But also, we need, sometimes we need people with skin on it to, um, to say we're proud of them or whatever. And... Um, that's a, key, that's a key part. And it's weird for us to think that God is proud of us. Like when I said, kind of almost on the side, you know, he has a picture of you in his wallet. He does, if he has a wallet. But he's proud of you, because you're his child. That's kind of random, but it really helps you when you have that mindset. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Um, kind of just an observation, but you said that the study of the last thing people say when they die. Yeah. Not when they say, but what they're thinking about, what their interests are. What they're thinking about yeah. Are. Yeah. You said everyone who's going to die wants a right relationship with God and a right relationship with their loved ones. Yeah. Right? That's what Kuber Ross said. Yeah. And, uh, Jesus said in, in somewhere in the New Testament that uh, the two greatest laws are to love God and to love the neighbor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So would that be maybe an indication of uh, yeah. God writing this sure. on our hearts? Yeah, I think so. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think so. You know, that, it's funny because I'm going to speak on that particular verse at church on Sunday. And one of the, and it comes out of, a, in the Old Testament, it comes out of something called the Shema. Have you guys studied that yet? Has anybody talked about the Shema? In here? It's Deuteronomy. It's the most often quoted scripture in the Bible. Um, don't cheat because I'm going to ask the people at church what's the most often quoted scripture and none of them will get it. So you can't cheat now that I've just told you that. But, um, but Jesus quoted the Shema. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. So that meant loyalty and faithfulness to God. But then what Jesus did was he changed the Shema, which was their holy of holies. Because love your neighbors, you love yourself is found in Deuteronomy, I mean, in Leviticus 19.3. So what he was doing is, he, that's how he summarized the importance of the entire Old Testament and all the laws. Love God, love your neighbor. The interesting side to it is he assumed we would love ourselves. There's people in this room who don't love themselves. So I, I meet with people every week who, are, who don't love themselves. And so they don't, they, they don't love, the, you know, they were made in the image of God, but they don't accept that. And so that's when they make some poor choices. You know, I've spent a lot of time with young women who cut themselves. Well, a lot of times they don't love themselves. So that's one of the reasons why they cut themselves. It's interesting. Yeah. But great observation there. Great screen. Pull that one out, Matthew 22. Yeah. What Bible translation do you use? I typically use the NIV. What you'll find sometimes with speaker types like me, so some of your other people are much better at being Bible teachers. I'm more of a speaker person. You know, so like I just spent the last, of the last five weeks, I was four weeks on the East Coast speaking at the National Single Moms Conference, the this and that. So what I tend to do is, I'll, like I'll quote, um, for example, the, the cheerful heart, that was NIV, but then you notice that I went to a, a more modern version <laughs> that says zaps a person's strength. Now that's a paraphrase. So in the Bible, and I hope they've probably taught you this already, but you know, there are versions of the Bible that are closest to the language, and then there are paraphrases which are not, um, they're more almost of an, an interpretation. That still doesn't mean it's, t like when I say zaps a person's strengths, that just is a more modern way of saying crushes your spirit. But, so, but you'll typically see me do NIV. What you find with people is they get used to a certain version, and sometimes they'll just keep with it, like me. I'll just keep with NIV for the rest of my life. There's some other versions that are awesome. But. Why do you ask? That's a great question. Uh, I'm just curious what someone you read, I can. OK, got it, yeah. Mainly NIV, but then you're going to go, what is this dude doing? Where is this? Sometimes I'll sneak living because I want to do the paraphrase and 
every so often I'll sneak in the message because I just think it's a really cool paraphrase, but again, it's not, th this is Eugene Peterson's, the message is kind of a popular version, or, but it's not really a version, it's a paraphrase. What else, anything else? Okay, let, I, you, we don't have a whole lot of time. I, wanted, I want you to have a break, but um, tell me how this works. Somebody help, oh yeah. Well, it's possible for us to have that conversation. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think it's a normal thing that if people only have fun and they don't have discipline, you know, there are people who are fun, if they're not studying scripture, they're not spending time with God, like what, you know, the other two things that I talked about, you know, it's, it's a part of, of making life full, but there are people who are just always doing fun. And, they, and in a bad way, that's almost becomes an, an addiction. So I don't, I, I, I think it's a, part of our life, but I don't think it's the only thing we should do. Um, that kind of summarizes. We might be able to talk more on it. You can bring it up again if you want. But, yeah, no. I think your statement's a little contradictory. It's how serious yeah. fun. Well, it's on purpose. <laughs> that's, that's more of a speaker than a Bible teacher. Because, you know, have serious fun, meaning lean into fun. But, yeah, it is contradictory. And it was meant that way. There's, there, sometimes... Uh, what I, my goal is I want you to remember that and that has a sarcasm in it. Have serious fun using the word serious next to the word fun. So you got it. Way to go. Okay, I want you to do something for me. Um, and again, this is just a real quick thing, but I would, I would like you to, to write, and we're only thinking about serious fun even though we could have talked about devotions and other things too. But I want you to, um, I want you to write down three things that give you, that you do that's fun, that bring joy into your life and actually kind of make you a better person. So you can do something that brings, that gives you joy and it doesn't make you a better person. So I have two brothers who are alcoholics. They have deep joy when they are like, you know, you know, you know, three sheets to the wind or whatever. I'm not talking about that kind of joy. But what can, you know, when you're, what, when you do something that's fun, how does that kind of, you know, what's, what's some of the things that you do, how does that enhance your, you know, your relationships, your own personal life, whatever. So take like one minute and do this. This isn't, you know, it's just a little exercise. So is that camera on? So I'm being filmed. Okay. I'm just, I won't pick my nose then. Um, not that I pick my nose in front of you anyway. Everybody have three? I see some people still with them. Name some. Somebody throw out, a, I mean, I won't have everybody go around, but somebody name a, you know, some, you know <coughs> name their three. Let's hear it. Climbing. Huh? Climbing. Climbing. How does climbing, and what does it do for you? Um, I like looking at a face and seeing the problem and what you're trying to get up, okay. and then figuring out the best way to go about it to get up it. You also have cool fellowship with a lot of different people. A yeah. Lot of right, right. That. Yeah. Plus, then you climb something. Then you did it. So you have to feel good about You look at that sucker, and some people are going, there's no way. And you, and you do it, and then you go, whoa. I, really good. Yeah. Buying people coffee. Buying people coffee? Awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That, you know, I love that. It's fun. And see, what you're getting is one is kind of more of an individual thing, although he mentioned that you know, there's some cool fellowship that goes on. But then with coffee, what you're doing is you're, you're giving them a gift, and then you're also now having the gift of, of interacting together. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, great job. Walking and hiking. Yeah. So what does that do for you? Mm, walking, being outside in that creation just like yeah. fills me up yeah. and gets me, makes my mind calm. Cool. Music gets out 
motions and yeah. just yeah. usually it's awesome. stuff and then playing games is just fun. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the game. But Yeah. Yeah, if you're not playing Monopoly and throwing Monopoly boards exactly. at you. At each other. <laughs> no, I, I love that. No, I think that's really, really key. So what you're doing is you're giving me simple things, which I'm really looking for. It's not like what would be so, you know, what's fun is to, you know, spend, you know, $9,000 and fly in a jet to France and, you know, go to the Eiffel Tower. I mean, that'd be cool. That'd be fun. But, but these are basic things that you can always do. What are a couple others? Yeah. Boogie board. Getting waves or whatever. Yeah. 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 And that's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I have found, I, one time I was really going through a tough time and a friend of mine goes, let's go surfing. And I go, I don't have time right now. He goes, you're going. He goes, you made an appointment with me for an hour and a half. So I get an hour and a half of your time. Let's go. And, and where my office is, it was kind of like you can almost see the water. So we went and we had a great time, except some five and six year olds were better than me, but that's another story. <laughs> Yeah, good deal. Good. So, what? Driving around back home. Yeah, driving, driving around. Yeah. So, what gives you joy in that? Kind of like a sense of like freedom. Like yeah. Go wherever I want and just like yeah. explore. Yeah, it's cool. I think exploring does that too. Yeah. Yeah. Learning people's passions. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I go fishing. Fishing? Yeah. Where are you from? Colorado. Colorado. Do you fly fish? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, give me an appreciation for creation and desire to preserve it. Yeah. yeah. It's really awesome. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? When, like for me, I fly fish. And to go fly fishing is so amazing because you're out there and you're in God's creation. And I don't, I mean, I like catching fish, but honestly, it's, yeah, yeah. And then you just, for me, it's catch and release. So I just send them back, except for one that I snagged accidentally and killed him, not meaning to. It's very sad. Um, I can't speak right now, but I love um, boating. Boating? Mm -hmm. Cool. Where are you from to boat? Colorado. Um, go up to like Mercy Desert. Yeah. And, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, it's a great time, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it's so good. Basically, simple things, but I'm amazed how many of you brought out something about nature and the beauty of, of nature. So here's what I want to say under this is so go do it. But also do it with some discipline. Bef you know, this isn't just about fun. I hope if you walked away from here and you go, oh yeah, this first session he just talked about fun. Yeah, fun, but also make sure that you're doing it mixed with, with um, good, healthy discipline. Some of us are much more um, able to discipline. Others of us who have adult ADD like me, um, it's harder to, to be disciplined. Did you have your hand up? No, you were just like fixing your hair. Okay, well, the hair's perfect. I never have to do that with mine, so there we go. My, I have a grandson who's, who I'll see on Sunday because he's coming. His name is James, named after me. And he says, Papa Jay has bald hair. I'm like, that's kind of like an oxymoron, James. And he goes, what's an oxymoron? What you just said. But, you know, I can't explain an oxymoron to him for, you know, he's a kid. But he calls it bald hair, and I just, I think that is the funniest thing that he, then one day he goes, I want to get a haircut like Papa Jay. And I'm like, no, you don't, dude. He has like really long surfer type hair. He, he actually got a surfboard for his birthday. So, he, you know, he's just this little surfer kid. And, you know, he doesn't need this shaved like that. But anyway, such is life. Okay. So tell me what happens now. So you guys get a little break and then we come back. Yeah. Is that how it kind of works?